This episode is sponsored by Victory Grips. Victory Grips are the standard in hand protection, plus they just launched their new gym affiliate program. As affiliate owners, they understand the demands of gym owners. Their goal is to keep their gym referral program process as simple as possible. You'll receive educational content, early access to upcoming releases, and exclusive discounts for your members, plus received a percentage of the net sales. Find out more at victorygrips.com. Welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast, where we chat with the best in the world about what they do. I'm your host, Dave Durante, with my co-host, Mike Service, and on today's episode, we have Grant McCartney, aka The Island Ninja. Now, Grant is, of course, known mostly for his incredible feats in the Ninja Warrior world, having competed on the show for the past 11 seasons. The guy is just an absolute beast when it comes to Ninja Warrior training, but he also has many other feats under his belt in the athletic training world, getting into CrossFit now and competed in the CrossFit Open for the last three seasons. We talk a little bit about this transition away from Ninja Warrior into more functional fitness, into some other areas that he wants to challenge himself within, but also what it was like growing up, dad playing in the NFL, a lot of other physical things that he was into, what allowed him to become the athlete that he is today, but more importantly, how he's become a great motivational figure for the next generation, how he's able to pass on the journey that he went through to be able to give athletes and young kids a chance to understand that they have the ability to do the same thing themselves. He wrote a children's book, Everyone Knows Flamingos Like to Party. We talk a little bit about that process, what it's all about, how he took pieces from his own life and was able to give that back to the next generation. Can't wait to read it myself with my kids. Love speaking with this guy. Hope to get him out the Power Monkey camp. In fact, the first time I met him was years ago where he was actually building a Ninja Warrior course at Flip Fest, which is the location where we host our Power Monkey camp. Love this guy and hope to have him back out to camp sometime soon. And we hope you guys enjoy this one too. All right, we'll just jump in. Grant, how you doing, man? Uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Uh, thanks for being with us. Yeah, man, good. Just uh, I'm a little, I'm a little wore out. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I need to take a little breather, and it's just been too many competitions in a row, and you can only do so much. So I'm gonna take a little downtime, uh, and before the next one, <laughs> I'm feeling a but little. You, beat you actually out. mentioned. Yeah, you actually mentioned that you're not even home. Home now being Hawaii, you're in yeah. Houston training, I'm assuming for another upcoming Ninja Warrior competition. So it sounds like downtime isn't in your near future. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, I can't say a lot about the season, but the way it goes, there's a round of competition. And let's suppose I make it to the next round of competition, there would be a, a break. Um, and then it would be on again. So there's this like, yeah, there's this period that potentially could have off <laughs> or okay. uh, or not or whatever. But <laughs> yeah, in season I'm out of Houston. I have to be here, train here, uh, which isn't bad. I mean, I have a great, this setup here is I've, I've really made it my training space. I have a sisu sauna and a cold plunge on the roof i have a full built out home gym everything built out by titan c2 just everyone hooked me up and i'm just stoked so i have everything i need and uh you know i'm definitely not trying to complain but it's definitely not my favorite home base understandable understandable well i i there's something that's always kind of like bugged me about how these seasons work uh you've been on Ninja Warrior from season seven to season 14, like 11 seasons. Like that's clearly like a season is not one per year. How do the seasons work? Are there, is it actually one per like fall, winter, spring, summer? How do they break those things up? Yeah. I mean, it should be one per year. Um, they haven't really ever done anything. And I guess the news is out now about this season, but they are filming two seasons this year. Um, I, on my podcast, we've announced a lot of stuff that I hope we can say, uh, which if anyone's interested in more podcast information, we're like the number one ninja podcast. It's a kind of nice show. Uh, so, but we even announced on there, Hey, we're, you know, we're filming two seasons back to back, which they don't, they've never done before, but they will do a ninja warrior regular season. And then specialty shows where we've gone from competing on American Ninja Warrior to 
Team Ninja Warrior to then flying overseas and doing, let's say, German Ninja Warrior or a special edition of a skill show on American Ninja Warrior. So it can be this stint of like pretty back to back to back to back competitions. And then that's why every year, let's call it August, I would have done filming Ninja stuff would start airing. And then I would try some new thing that had nothing to do with Ninja Warrior where that was like run a sub five minute mile or do a half Ironman or whatever. I would take a month, train, try it, and then get back on the cycle at Ninja for the next year. But um, that that's kind of the flow of it. End of the year, do, do other things. Very end of the year, start back training. By March, we're competing. And then through July, really. So it when sounds the, like when you're the, just... Go for I it, was Mike. Gonna say, just, just for my, I'm trying to remember a little bit. Um, so you, you're generally like in your little break time when um, the Hawaiian trail runs going on, right? Yeah. Cause that was, I, I was trying to remember, I mean, I, we saw each other at the games this year and I'm like, I know that, that we met each other before. And then you mentioned it, that it was at the trail run and we were packing stuff up uh, and we were riding back and forth in the back of the car. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think at that point you were talking about like heading back to Houston and everything. So now, now I'm getting more perspective on like a, a year in the life of Grant. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, it's good. I live a good life for sure. I, I am making some changes though. I made some changes this year. This will, um, this will be the last year I probably do Ninja Warrior and I've been doing it for a long time and, and I loved the uh, the new stuff I've gotten into the last two years, and I think I'm going to switch and really invest my time and energy into something that also is growing Ninja. I don't know how much it's still growing or not, but um, you know, giving it a good go this year, and then stuff even inside of CrossFit with being with the Buttery Bros more often. And the last couple of years at all the major CrossFit events, it's really fun to be there and do stuff like that. And I'm excited about the different ways of using my body, whether you know, I'm a heavier dude now too. I have competed as low as 185, but I'm like 207 now because I just like to lift and that only gains weight. So I'm like, I don't know, maybe I just put on a bunch of weight and see what happens. But I am excited to make some some transitions with a little less travel, a little different kind of training and a little different kind of content stuff that I create as well. Does, does that sound that the the CrossFit competition world might might see a little bit more grant these days. You want to actually get competitive in the CrossFit space potentially? I don't know. I I definitely like I like CrossFit. I have fun and I really enjoy it. I don't know if I need to make it competitive. I don't know if I need to get that. I don't know if I need to become that. Like right now is is a really thought process time where I'm picking and choosing the next moves. But I don't think that it needs to be that I try to go to the games or try to do CrossFit competitions. I genuinely enjoy it. And I, and I like learning about the mechanics and how a body is supposed to work and operate inside of a healthy system and doing lifts the right way. And even stuff we were talking about at uh, Waterpolis on how to hold, for, you know, external internal mm -hmm. rotation on the rings and like learning your body is stronger a certain way, even though if it doesn't feel strong now because you haven't developed the muscles it's meant to be a certain way and, you know, learning from different disciplines and hopefully teaching other people because of that. That's exciting to me. And I have fun and Ninja was fun. And it's just been a long time. It's been a lot. And I was just telling my buddies last night, like, I think, you know, I'm going to be done doing Ninja Warrior and I want to celebrate being done. It's not a, it's not, it's not a sad thing or I'm like ready to do another thing. Uh, but also to celebrate how awesome it's been. And I mean, this year still stacked full of competitions and stuff that I've been doing here and internationally, but it's just, I think next year I'm going to give it a old pump the brakes a little bit. We'll see. Now, before we, we get into something like that, I want to stick on the CrossFit topic for a second, just, uh, and talk a little bit about types of workouts you enjoy. Obviously like, the, the mentality of most CrossFitters, right? The ones that aren't anticipating going to semis in a few weeks or going to the games, the ones that just enjoy it for quality of life and be able to move better and stay with the community. What what are the workouts that you kind of gravitate towards? It sounds like you have kind of a lot of interests and you're good at a lot of different things, but what are the workouts where you're like, all right, this is in my wheelhouse. I know I'm going to crush this type. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some when I see it on the board that it's just an all out hammering unbroken. And that's, that's fun to me, obviously, I have good grip strength from Ninja Warrior. So there's one and it's some I forgive me for not knowing all the names in CrossFit. There's one of them that's like kettlebell swings, pull ups and running. And uh, whatever that one is, that's how I yeah, I can just crap on that one because it's just I'm pretty much just running as hard as I can, then everything else is unbroken. Um, and as fast as I, you can, pretty much anyone can do them. I mean, there's little things I'm learning since I'm tall that like the kettlebell, I have to actually pull it down and I could save a second here and there, but it really just comes down to running. And so that's always nice. I like lifting heavy. I'm not good at it. I'm not the, you know, my power totals are nowhere near anybody's, but I, I just like getting in and, and having, It'd be Ninja. Okay. So Ninja Warrior specifically is you get one try, you get no warm up, you get no studying and practicing. You just get put on the course, you do it or you don't do it and it's over. So the pressure of that is not exciting. It's not fun. And I can go in and try to lift something really heavy and fail it and then go psych myself up and then make the next lift or fail twice and then make the third lift, whatever. I, so I I'm enjoy that power lifting and learning more about Olympic lifting but yeah, if I see anything with grip, anything on the bar, especially bar muscle up, ring muscle up's a little more mechanics that I, I'm still finalizing. Obviously, I can do them, but uh, when fatigue sets in, you got to be a little smarter. When it's a bar, I can just rip bar muscle ups over and over and over because it's like, oh, I'm just swinging around. So anything there's a, like with those movements, I guess I hone in more on the ones that lately I've just been honing on what I'm not good at. And then I've been trying to get better. But anything with run, you know, even with a, a row, uh, some cardio mixed with some technical movement that I have grip strength on, it's, it's like, it's going to go well. Grant, I, I want to see you train and then take on King Kong. What's King Kong? So, so King Kong, it, it was like really, really popular early on because they were numbers that almost nobody could hit. So like, if you could do it, everybody would go crazy, but it's, um, it's, I'll look at it so I don't mess it up. So it's one deadlift at 455, two muscle ups, ring muscle ups, three squat cleans at 250, and then four handstand push ups for three rounds. Wait, so, wait, it was, it was, what was the weight on the squat clean? 250. 250 squat clean. Okay. And then what was the last thing? Four handstand push-ups. Oh, and you just do this for three rounds? Yep. Oh, we're close. Yeah, I mean, the deadlift is something I've always been good at. I, I mm -hmm. know I can do 450. I've done 475. Um, so I know I could do that. I also want to do the deadlift mile, whatever, 500-pound deadlift yep. and run a mile. But um, so you just do that. The cleans are going to be interesting. I think I should be <laughs> fine. I know I, I've cleaned over 250 before, but um, it could get weird. I think I'll be fine though. And then put, put that one in your off season, put that one on your, you want to, you want to try that one out. Cause that there, there were some, some epic videos in the past of, of guys giving that a try. And then some guys spicing it up and Dave, Isn't you remember? It, it seems like it would just be a big meaty fell of lift fest. Like, I mean, if you're just big and strong, it wouldn't be hard essentially. But, but it was like in the, you know, in the, um, early days of CrossFit, it was like, you were one or the other. So there were lots of guys that could deadlift and clean, and then they wouldn't be able to get over the rings for the muscle up, or they wouldn't be able to get the hands. We need to do an upgraded up. King Kong. We need to do upgraded King Kong. Yeah. We need to do like wall facing deficit handstand pushups instead. Yeah. And all these things that are now the challenging upgrades to those things. And now just about that everybody can do not, not for you, Grant. Like, we can give you kind of King Kong. <laughs> Actually, I, I, would I would recommend, <laughs> but we should have you come back to Power Monkey Camp and do it there because I want to bring this up. Like, uh, I don't know how many years ago we actually met kind of in passing or however it yeah. was at Flip Fest, which is a location on Crossville where we host our Power Monkey Camp. But you're originally from not that far away, right? You're from uh, basically down the road. Yeah, yeah you're from uh, about an hour away. I'm flying there tonight. Oh, amazing. Amazing. And... Uh, how did you get in touch with John and John, the owners of uh, Flip Fest, and how did you kind of get involved with uh, what they got going on over there? I wish I could remember the initial. It might have been through – there was a local gymnastics gym that uh, had me come out and teach some camps and clinics and then bring other people in. And 
this is when I was touring around more doing uh, big clinics for Ninja Warrior and gymnastics gyms were trying to keep either get started in Ninja or try to revitalize the men's youth group where they were, they were losing a lot of young men's interest and then Ninja was gaining interest and it was just come have fun and see this maybe do a Ninja class. And so we were doing, you know, a couple hundred kids come out, teach them and have some fun. Maybe it was through that. I don't remember, but I got in contact with them and they were, um, they were needing some new obstacles and um, I, I, somehow I got connected or whatever it was, but uh, I, I got a hold of a buddy who builds and we designed some stuff for their out, outdoor course that could live outside and um, be all right out there. And then we went and built and then we, we did it at the camp and, and it, it was tough because we were right getting into COVID too, where the second year stuff really kind of COVID wasn't great, but yeah. Yeah, it was cool, man. They had a great facility over there. I mean, obviously, you guys know, a uh, super fun space uh, to get in the water and the blob. And then you're up and we, we're out. I got all the kids in the woods over there. We're doing the ninja courses, but we come meet the gymnasts and we do a big course run in front of them. The gymnasts have such excitement and camaraderie. We got to bring our small group of ninjas to kind of meet them. And uh, even Caitlin Ohashi was there when I went, which was really cool to meet her. I didn't really know a ton about the gymnastics crowd, but getting to meet her, we became good friends. And I just, host, I host a show with Spartan called Never Done. And I had her as a guest. So years later, this was just a couple months ago, I took her out and we ran a Spartan together. We did some training. We talked about her life and where she's at now. And so great friendships from that. And, uh, and a lot of jokes too. Uh, I don't know what stuff I'm allowed to tell, but we were out at one city. Gosh, we were out at one city. They had a, an event john had an event they we were up there and and we got out on these scooters and we were just ripping through the town we were the scooter gang and i still every once in a while have a comment on my post to just say like scooter gang and it brings back good memories <laughs> Yeah, those guys are freaking hilarious like john and john if you ever get a chance to hang out with them they're the best but um Coming out to camp and everything, I think most of it, especially if we got campers listening, that we do have that course out in the woods. And I always have to tell that it's not for them. Like, you have to stay off the course because if anything happens out there, we, you know, it's not part of camp and everything. But if we get you back out teaching a little extra seminar, I think the campers would absolutely love, like, getting getting out there and actually doing it properly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the big thing is I set it up so it's progressive, but there is – a, a certain certain movements will cause certain failure points and i know those failure points so i would have a team for the specific failure points where we would mat it but also you know if someone's going to try something new in this spot this is how it's going to fail and we can spot bodies that way and uh and so we always would but it usually you know people's grip give up they try one more swing and they peel and we know exactly where they're going to give up or or else they're not going to even get to that point and then there's a safer fall so yeah, it's it, it's not that obstacles are unsafe. I know that's not what you were saying, but it's really knowing the fail points. Just like, you know, and in gymnasts, you know where it's going to go wrong. It's not when they're sprinting down the the path. I don't know what you call the path to the vault, but it's not the sprint. Runway. Toward, yeah, the runway is not where people are failing. It, it's, you know, right at the springboard or it's right after they hit the vault, like in the air, you know it's knowing those spots and doing ninja for this long. I know those spots. That's the only reason why we always want to have somebody to mitigate any kind of injury. Cause you can get injured in anything, but we can really mitigate that a lot knowing, Oh, this is usually, yeah, it's right here where it's going to, you know. First I'll say, uh, you may not have seen too many gymnasts actually running because, <laughs> uh, running down the road, Runway is a horrific event for many gymnasts. It's embarrassing, and there have been many of an injury for gymnasts running it. 76 feet down the runway. Yeah, it's a, an embarrassing endeavor. But there you go. Yep, hand up. Yep, a lot of arms, arms out to the sides. <laughs> it's, I've never seen such like... like yeah, we... Uh, it is a, a, a funny now story, but... um. When I was in college, we had uh, a little period where we got to train with some of the other collegiate teams and coaches. So we went to like the diving team and the diving coach taught us some, you know, air awareness into the pool. And then we worked with the 
wrestling coach and, you know, he taught us some strength drills, or whatever. And then we went to the track and field coach and he was going to teach us some sprinting. And so we all got to the track and we were all lining up and he made us go through some like very basic, just uh warm up drills and skipping drills and whatever. My, and he was just like, stop, stop, stop. Like, I can't even teach you guys. Like, this is embarrassing that you're a collegiate athletes. Like, we're going to have to like start over and just teach you how to walk first. So we were like, yeah, we don't really have time for that. We're just going to go back to the gym. It was like one of the most embarrassing group of athletes who consider themselves to be pretty athletic that I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Don't ask a gymnast to do anything outside of flips. You know, all <laughs> really high end athletes are good at what they do, but they're, they don't need to be good at everything. Specialists. Yeah, specialist yeah specialist. oh they're special right. what what would, what what is your athletic background what did you grow up doing and uh kind of uh what was your sport of choice growing up i don't know if i'm a specialist because the things that i most excelled at were very different i mean for one i played everything growing up i literally was a part of two or three sports at a time where i would leave school i would go straight to track where i would do the decathlon so different all kinds of events there and then i would leave track to go downtown where i was on the dive team which was just because you get to jump in the water and then sit in a hot tub with all girls there was no guys on the team I was like, this is right. i'm doing this for sure and then i would leave that and and go to basketball and and so shout out to my dad who would take me to all these things um and then that's just in that season and then in the other seasons it was rugby or it was volleyball or it was you know other stuff outside of school too and I was like all the while that's happening I was a, a sponsor skateboarder so you know how does that fit in I don't know what to tell you but then when I got to college I played rugby at the University of Tennessee uh, I was also still skateboarding and I got a sponsor and that's why I uh, ended up moving to Hawaii to skateboard for them and live there and so I got a weird mixture of things. Now I wasn't great at everything, but I played everything and I liked to play. And my dad was supportive of just like, Hey, as long as you give it your, your, you know, your best and then stuff I would do and quit doing. Cause I was like, okay, we did a season that wasn't fun anymore. Uh, but I would play almost anything. You're like, so you were when like you're, the, when you're working with like kids, the sport, mutt, the sport, mutt grant, you were just like a mix of everything. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was great. It was a great way to keep me out of trouble too. I, I have, uh, I have a lot of things that would maybe deter me to, you know, in the school, they try to diagnose me with ADHD and all. And I'm like, it is what it is by now. I, I get it. I, I think about a lot of things I do. I, was, I don't care if you title me something like I, I, I have my own system of how I do it. And I just do a lot. And yeah, there's something to specializing for sure. I, I never like completely excelled. I mean, I would go to state and track and state and diving and do well, but I, it was never like I was a national champion, but, and then in college I had some SEC awards for rugby and it was not like I was doing bad by any means, but I, I was, I was winning awards and scoring and doing things like that. But I was also like, okay, what's next? What are you doing? And, and, Athletics was a great outlet to keep me from, I just remember people smoking, like a lot of my homies, because I skateboarded, right? A lot of people smoke, smoke weed and all different kinds of stuff. And it was just kind of easy not to get into smoking because it's like, I got to run. Like, I, I can't, I can't even start down this avenue. I, I got to run somewhere tomorrow. Like, or this thing that kept me alive on the rugby field was being faster than everyone else and not getting train wrecked by these huge Polynesian guys. And I thought, okay, well, so it was a good outlet and I played a lot of things. That, that I mean, that that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, right? All your friends are doing, you know, one thing and you prioritize something completely different, like uh, uh, an athletic endeavor, or whatever. What, what do you think kind of allowed you to be able to make that choice and be able to make the sacrifice and say, I'd rather wake up early and go running and, and better myself in this area rather than, you know, do what everybody else is doing at a young age. I imagine that that's some of the things you pass along to the kids you talk to today, but how, how does that happen in you? Is it something innate? Yeah, it, it's the tasting of what's better. Once you've tasted what's better, you don't really look at not having what's better. And that relates in a lot of ways. And I'm not going to, open that can of worms too deep, but I could. But what I'm getting at is once you realize 
for me, I was excelling in certain areas and I would always just kind of have in my back pocket, well, I can always reach in and I can right now run a, you know, a good 5k time. I could right now get like, I just always have had an ability to dive into an athletic bag and pull it out. Cause I've always just always maintained that I've never done stuff to diminish that, whether that's abusing, um, which a lot of people like alcohol and drugs, but yeah, that, that you could say don't abuse alcohol and drug. Well, the fact is that then affects the thing you're abusing that's good for you, like sleep. I always sleep really well. I've never had a hard time falling asleep. I've never had where I just kick around. I always sleep super hard because I work out or busy throughout the day, and then I just fall asleep in bed. Now I've never abused sleep. The good thing, it's just always been easy and good. And then with that gives me more recovery and keeps this whole train rolling. Well, the same thing, I've tasted the what it's like to be healthy and to, to be able to run and not get super winded right away. Like a lot of people would at different ages or never have running or as a background of anything. And I play touch rugby now on Sundays and yeah, I just see a lot of people get really winded and that's not the problem for me. And so once you realize that I just go, well, I don't want to give that up. So I look at my buddies when I was younger who were smoking and drinking and whatever. And not to say I didn't, choose to do stuff too. Like, I mean, when I was younger, I got in some trouble for drinking and different things. And, um, but I saw that that wasn't serving them well, you know, I, and the guys I skated with and we'd go out to film and they'd be like, oh, we're going to film this part tonight. You know, this is for a company. Let's do it. And they would all get high and then we wouldn't film anything because they'd just be too blitzed to film. And I'm like trying tricks over and over and over. And I'm like, okay, I got it. And they're just like, yeah, what? And I thought, oh, this isn't a good look. You know, it, it's easier once you've tasted and seen the better thing. Once you taste and seen the better thing, you don't worry about like, maybe I should go back. Like once you've had, you know, a proper like Wagyu burger, you don't go, man, I could really go for a, a Whopper right now. Or you know what I mean? Like you, you don't go back and be like, ah, I wish that other not as good thing I had right now. That's kind of the way athletics has been where I never even like tripped on, man, I wish I could sit around and smoke more often. You know, I like my lungs. I like running. I like feeling good. I like mental clarity. I like, you know, it's easy. Grant, did your, did your dad have a, um, let's say a strong influence in sports? Cause he had a sport background, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad played as a professional football player in the NFL. <laughs> So, so <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he, we, we have, we got to talk about that. I wasn't bringing it up later, but I mean, I'm, I'm a huge football fan. So we got to talk about this at least a little bit. Yeah. Let's hear I mean, it. Was it like growing up NFL fan? Yeah. My dad was, uh, he played for the Falcons and the Rams back when the Rams were in LA the first time. So we're talking, he was, this is before my time. He was played at university of Tennessee. He was captain in 75 or something. And then I think, 80 so he played for you know multiple years there in the nfl in the 80s and then by the time i came around in 88 he had already been out for a couple of years and so it was not like i was like going to games as a kid like looking at the stands but my dad uh we always did things physical too we you know even whether it was like we had time together my parents got divorced so we were when we were with him on weekends we'd always go hit golf balls or we'd go to the batting cage or we'd play putt putt or we'd throw the football and i remember as a kid him throwing it and like it hurt my hands when I catch the ball and I'm like, dad, take it easy. Like I'm a kid, dude. Why are you throwing so hard? <laughs> and then he's always like, if it hits you in the hands, you got to catch it. And, but he was always jokes. It was always loving and support. And um, to this day, my dad tells stories about some of the greatest things that he experienced in my sports were never my wins. Like I, he was never like, well, when Grant, I hit many game winner basketball shots. I had many state championships, this and that. But like his favorite stories and the ones I love to hear from him is one as I played baseball and I, I was not good at baseball. I could do it, but they put me in the outfield. And then whenever I go to bat, they just hit me with the ball. And I was like, this sport sucks. And <laughs> I'm up to bat. Uh, I, I get a base hit. I'm on third. We're about to win. If we get one more point, someone hits it. I'm running home right at the sliding in game on the line. If it, they, it's an out, the game's over. If I score, we won. And they said it was really close. So they tagged me. And then they said, it's always out, whatever. And everyone starts crying. We're kids, you know? Oh my gosh. Like, this is it. Oh. 
and everyone's crying and all bummed and and I run over to my dad and and I, my dad says like he just came up to him and said dad you see that you see that I could have won it for us and <laughs> I think my dad knew in that moment that I had I got it I got the idea that we may not always win and it's great to win I'm not trying to act like it isn't but what a cool moment. I could have, I could have won. And, and I'm not afraid of failure in sports. I'm not afraid of failure in life because I know I'm well loved growing up. I think you know, even Adam Sandler just made a point about that. He just won the Mark Twain award. If you go listen to his acceptance speeches, he talks about how he was so loved by his family. It made him feel like he was so much greater than maybe he was at the time and was successful out of that same story. My dad and my mom, they loved me. Well, I felt loved. It made me not feel like, I, I didn't feel scared to uh, fail and that allowed me to try more and that allowed me to succeed more in extra things that a lot of people may not even get to because they're too afraid to screw it up. So yeah, I mean, a big attribute to my dad who is just always there. That's a key point of being a good father that I learned from him. And it was wild because he didn't know his dad until he was like 30 some years old, like 38 years old. My mom found his dad and, and my, his dad was never around, but he is this amazing father who's always there. It's just great to see and learn from that and how that gave me the ability to even sometimes overextend myself in areas, lose, fail, and still be like, oh, that's okay. We failed that one, but let's do another one. It's because I had this breadbasket, the support of love that I knew from my family. So shout out to my dad. I love that, man. I mean, that's such a powerful thing to be able to to lean on in situations where, you know, you come, you, you confront a failure opportunity and say, you know, this is either going to make or break me, but I know that if I fall back, somebody's going to catch me and, um, and prop me up. Now, for the people out there listening that maybe don't have the ability to lean on somebody um, or didn't grow up with, you know, parents there were as uh, positive of an influence as yourself. How do you convey that to that person, whether it's a kid growing up that maybe comes from a family that doesn't have the same love and support that you did? Um, you know, we we try to build a community within Power Monkey that allows for that kind of thing to happen, right? Like we all love each other as if we're we're blood and and you know, no matter what happens, we all know that we have each other's back no matter where we are in the world kind of a thing. But I'm curious, like with with all the message that you pass along to kids, next generation, all the people that you work with, um, it's great to hear that you had that. But how do you pass that on to to, to someone that doesn't and still be able to find that still ability to overcome uh, that failure and have that same attitude? Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And and I don't want to make a facade like everything's great all the time. I mean, my parents were divorced when I was young, and my mom got remarried. Um, and also my mom tried to commit suicide when I was younger and I found her in my house. Um, my stepdad and mom both have passed away since. Um, and it's not like this happy go lucky. Everything's been perfect for me. I just have these great parents all the time. I'm just highlighting the things that we did well. And one of the reasons why I sometimes can be nervous about becoming a father myself is like, you're going to screw something up. Everyone's going to screw something up. And everyone's got a story. People got the perfect family. They still got a story too. And <clears throat> so what I would address in this specific question is it's not that I fell back into my dad's arm and he lifted me back up and he, he paid the bills to just let me do whatever. And like financially is a good way for me to think about failing. Like obviously if I go out and try to beat someone in a competition and I fail, I didn't really lose anything. I just kind of, you know, maybe your self mental attack, you lost some confidence, but like you're not out any money or unless you got injured, but like, you know, if you think about, oh, I bought a house and then it got burned down and then I lost all that money, it can feel like <clears throat> a big loss. It was never like that with my dad. He's never just like backing me with like, oh, you screwed up, well, you know, or here's, I worked hard for all the things I did. The thing that he was though, was there. Being there can, can be the thing. It's not that he's, catching me or like I'm falling back into him. it's this idea of being loved the idea of being it being okay because now my standard of am I loved is not based off of how well I do you know it's on, it's on something else and to, to open that whole can of worms up even deeper I mean obviously I, I'm like I'm a Christian and I believe that God loves me and that's 
the highest form of feeling love to me, that allows me to, again, operate inside of parameters that failure happens and go, no, my, my, my self-worth is not based in how well I did. So I, I guess I first address that. It's not this catching. It's not this, these parents that just hover like helicopters over you and they just they fix every little thing. And so you can do whatever you want. Honestly, I think that's unhealthy, but for someone who maybe doesn't have uh, that, I first want to say with my mom being gone, I still need a mother in my life and I feel it a lot. I'm 34, about to be 35. And I feel like I just want a mom to call me and say, Hey, you know, just thinking about today. I love you in a way a mother would. And that hasn't, it's been a long time since my mom has passed away. And I still feel that. What I've done is I've chosen and I pray and I ask God for those people, but I've seen people that kind of become a mother with a role to me and, uh, a role to me, and I let them be that. I, I let them be mother and me be son and that, and they're not my mom. They can act like that. So sometimes we let people, and the point here is not, okay, just go pick someone and make them your mom. Like there is a divine piece to this that I would have a disclosure about it, uh, but but I would say there is a letting of people that are friends to be more than uh, that, to be this family element, to be this like you can you can have love for other people that aren't just your family. You can have trust and you can build in security through that. You can also have people that step in that role from time to time. So just because you don't have that right now or your parents aren't around or your grandparents they raised you or gone out to you or whatever it may be. That doesn't mean that there's no one to love you or there's no, I'm, I've always been great at making friends. So this part has come easy to me. I have a lot of friends and through that I have a, a large network of people that I've been fortunate to have in my life. And then it's kind of easier to have those moments of being like, Oh, my friend's mom has always been a really good mom to him. And it's always sweet on me. Oh, wait a second. Maybe I can talk to her and say, Hey, you know, because my mom and da da da, like, and, and then she starts to, step into that motherly role a little bit more of my life, not completely or totally or whatever, but it's there. That can be the case. That's one case that I would, I would hope through maybe asking and, and seeing if God can provide that in, in your life, but also knowing that just having that in particular isn't like a catch all safety net. It's more the idea, idea of knowing your self-worth isn't based in your performance um, and that's where God can come into play. Cause even if you don't ever have a person there, and I believe like you can pray and ask God and talk to him and understand. And through the context of Christianity, there's a saving and there's an understanding through that, that you are redeemed, that you are well loved right as you are working through whatever it is you're working through. And that creates a really interesting place where I'm like, I don't know how everyone doesn't believe in Christianity because this is, this is a great easy start. You just got to believe and you're just well loved. Like this is great, but uh, I, but I get it. So I hope that helps. That's a tough one to explain, but it's a really good point. And I hope that I belittled at least the fact that like, I just had this big safety net and it was all good. I got it, Dave. I got to uh, give you and Grant a lot of credit on that one. That was like a really good question you asked, but it was also really hard. So Grant, good, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, good way to, to answer that. And just like per personally, what I took from that is um, one big thing to kind of own through everything is your perspective. So like mm -hmm. situations are going to happen. Um, reactions and responses from other people are going to happen, but like your perspective within all of those situations is a little bit of what yeah, breeds into your ecosystem, breeds into your community. And then it's a little bit of that, like you reap what you sow. So if you're putting something good out there, you're more likely to catch what's good coming back. Not always. And that's okay. Um, and you can't rely on somebody to, to catch you. Um, yeah. but, but knowing that, yeah, you, you know, you're going to fail, um, but you're going to be willing to also rise to the occasion when it, when it comes. So it was, uh, yeah, I, I liked your answer. <laughs> Dave, I liked your question. That was a good one. A great question. Oh, well, thanks for sharing Grant. Uh, I appreciate, uh, um, you know, telling us a little bit more insights into, you know, the life, because I think sometimes people get a skewed perspective from social media and like all the bright spots and all the beautiful things that happen that, uh, uh they think that, 
because of the struggles that they have in their life that um, achieving those things are not possible. And, uh, you know, you're yeah. highlighting the fact that it's part of life that you go through struggles and you come up better on the other side of it with with surrounding yourself with the people that help. Definitely. And I think there's just apart from the depths of this question is just people don't understand that failure is almost necessary for success. Like, I don't know why it's like we're so scared of failing or we can't fail or if I failed, I ultimately it's all over. It's like, no, dude, fail. You cannot get good without failing. It's like the part it's it has to, it's a part of the equation. You can't take it out. It's all it's almost necessary to get to success. But we're so bought in on like, we can't fail. I, I got to succeed. I got to make it. It's like, it's okay to fail. Um, but that's a, just a shallow part of it. That's I don't think people understand. And then they get scared to, to fail. So they don't even try. So they don't even get anywhere near success because they think failing is not okay. And it's like, all right, whatever. Yeah. And I, I, Mike, the way you were uh, uh, mentioning, you know, uh, posing the question and, and phrasing it, it makes me think, think of uh you know when Jocko Jocko Willing talks about no matter what happens perspective again really can help out in terms of how you deal with any situation he just says good to any situation right that that famous quote of him being on a podcast talking about you lose your job how do you how do you deal with it good you know uh, my house burned down good no matter what the worst thing that you can possibly imagine if you frame it particularly can turn into something that actually leads you down a path to make it into something that in the end becomes a positive for you. So I think you're so right, Mike, that perspective when it comes to these things really matters. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it can be a huge table turner in terms of um, getting out on the other side more quickly and with a better perspective. Um, something interesting here, children's books. We're talking all about this, this, uh, you know, crazy physical achievements and all these amazing things, living all over the world, doing amazing things. But you wrote a children's book. Everyone knows have, flamingos yeah. like to party. There it is. Nice little copy of that. Everyone knows flamingos love to like to party. Tell us what this is all about. Like, what, what's the what's the idea behind it? What gave you the impetus to say, oh, we got to do this thing? Uh, tell us a little story behind it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something I always wanted to do. I wrote poetry and I, I, my mom was an artist. And so I always had like a little creative outlet that I've always fed. And sometimes I denied for a while. And then I would be, Oh, artists and people. I think that if we don't feed our creativity, when we start to feel it, it becomes something we resent or get weird about. And we don't realize we're just not feeding our creative, creative side. And I knew one day when I was reading to my nieces and nephews, my sister has, three kids and I was reading them bedtime stories, which is a love, lovely thing to read to kids at nighttime. I just, and I am a bad reader. <laughs> I gotta reiterate, this is something I'm, I'm not good at, but to do it with kids and do the voices and, you know, sing them to sleep almost is, it's a beautiful, tender thing. And I love it. And I was doing it with my niece's nephew and there was this book my sister had and she's, She's got her own opinions about stuff, but the book was teaching some just silly things. And I was like, you could tell they're just forcing these ideas that I was like, oh, these are kids. Like, uh, I don't know about this. And I thought, you know, I could I could write a children's book <laughs> and uh, and teach some things that I think are, are genuinely true and good. And and so I knew I was going to do that, but I was so busy with Ninja Warrior. And I was like, ah, and I just schedules are crazy. And that took last year off of Ninja Warrior. And so I wrote it. And I tweaked really hard because it's not just I wrote a children's book. I wanted it to have couplets and triplets that rhymed on every page and everything to end with. Everyone knows Flamingos like to party. So it reiterates that story. And the end is like this culmination of everything. And you can do different voices with each character. And that on top of me trying to teach the idea. And the idea is simply that all the first of all, the characters are all real people in my life. And my grandmother loved flamingos. She just had little flamingos on all kinds of stuff. And I wrote this, everyone knows flamingos like to party because my grandmother loved to party. She loved to get everyone together. And that could be anywhere. If she ever came up on some money somehow or whatever, she'd be like, hey, okay, we're all gonna da-da-da. I, I bought a lake house. Let's all go there. Let's, it was always inviting the family to be together. And I have that in me too. But it took getting older to understand it was because she invited us all, created the space and invited us all to come. And now with her gone, 
no one's doing that in my family. And I felt that grief of that. I missed that. And I, I wanted to be that, but I was also just kind of like, oh man, right? And so I thought I'll honor her in this book that way that Bradley the bear is trying to throw a party and he doesn't know how. And he goes to all his friends, Tristan the turtle. Um, you, everyone tells him something unique about if you're gonna throw a party, you have to pick the right food, the location, the time to start. Fiona the fox says you gotta pick the right music and all these, things and people and venues even in here are from my real life that no one would ever know but it's just fun for me in the story and so he does all this plans he's got the place the time the clothing the everything but forgets to invite everybody right as he's like oh we've done it he forgets to invite everyone and every page ends with the person teaching him the lesson that oh i learned that because everyone knows flamingos like to party because they went to a party of flamingo through well at the end when he forgets Patty Flamingo, my grandmother, comes up and says, don't worry, you know, you forgot, but I got tons of friends that love to party and they'll send out all the invites. And so they all went out, dropped off all the invites, uh, and then everyone shows up and everyone's here at the party. And you can see the, my, my buddies and illustrator, a good friend of mine, he drew me in here, the vanilla gorilla. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, my dad, he, he took actual pictures of my dad and then made the character of Bradley the Bear to look like him. And something that people would never know, but I want them to know, which I write in the dedication, is just that we got to remember to invite people. We can't just expect, sometimes I love people being there, but I forget, I got to plan and, and, and just tell people, hey, I want you to come to this. I want you to be there. Come on out. We got to remember to invite. And that ties into the same thing in Christianity that, sometimes I forget that we need to invite people either to come to learn and know more about what it is I believe in and they could believe the same or come to church or come to, but we have to invite them. And then ultimately that heaven is a place that you can invite them to by believing the same thing as well. But that's just a secondary part of like, someone could just read it and go, remember kids, you got to remember to create fun stuff and you got to invite people. That's a way we love on each other or whatever. And so I wrote it to, talk about my family, remember them, think about them often. I'd be lying if I said there's one page in here that I don't read and cry every single time I read it aloud at groups. But uh, I, it's been fun. I've been on surf trips and translate it in Spanish as I'm reading it to kids. It just, I always keep one on me and the interactions I have, it's just, it's amazing. I, I never planned on making big sales. Of course, it's on Amazon and it's got some bestsellers in different little categories, but it's just something that it's cool. It's cool to create something that was in your head. And I love reading to kids. So I'll probably make some more and do more because I really love it. But yeah, that's kind of the rundown of it. Beautiful, man. I love it. Uh, I, I, I want I the got... sequel to be Scooter Gang. So Scooter yes. Gang Scooter needs Gang. to be next. <laughs> well, I think the first one I'm going to do like a, a Everyone Loves Tacos, but I'm not sure yet because I have one that from being in Mexico a bunch for surf trips and things that I'm like, could write that one. Scooter Gang would, might, that would, that would be a sick one. I mean, I could, it's, it's actually not, <laughs> you can make it not hard to write a children's book too if you're inclined towards wanting to write and being silly and loving you know, the, obviously the way we talk to kids is not the same. Um, but if you can, if you're good, it's pretty easy to publish and get a book out there. Oh, don't tell Chad Vaughn that. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe we got to get, you know, what we should probably do. We should probably get Chad <laughs> to write a children, children's weightlifting book. <laughs> he can start with the uh, children's mobility for weightlifting. Um, yeah. We've, Ch Chad's been, Chad's been working on his, his book for uh, a while now. And we know the struggles that come along with writing, you know, uh, an educational text, Ooh, but yeah. uh, maybe, maybe this maybe this is a, a good boost to Chad to say, hey, let's start with a weightlifting children's book and then we'll go from there. But uh, I, I got to say that your your book kind of hit me because uh, I just got done reading to my my kids to bed and it's it's my favorite time of the day, too. And um, one of their favorite books is Dragons Love Tacos. And yeah. everything you were talking about, I was like, this reminds me of Dragons yeah. Love Tacos, like yeah. love to party having those tacos and everything. And I'm living in Italy right now. And oddly enough, the area that I'm in is known for having a ridiculous amount of flamingos. Like there are so many flamingos here. It's like bizarre. Like 
I have that no idea wild. why, but there are there are a crazy amount of flamingos right outside my door right now, which is very yeah. strange. So there's a lot of well, parallels with what's going on in my life right now. I'm going to I, I, don't oh, I would love it. Italy, but we'll definitely get books out there. One and you know, especially because I don't know who wants or doesn't want one. But if you are into reading your kids, this is so fun because I even put the text in the colors of the person speaking. And if you're, you know, if you like to have the fun with it, you go into Tristan and make up his voice. He sounds like this. And Bradley's up here, you know, whatever. And it, and it oh, yeah. just like the, the cadence of stuff, just to give you like a line. So you get kind of the idea of uh, out of his pocket of slacks, he pulled out some snacks. I always come prepared, you see. When people are hungry, they get pretty gr grumpy, but not when there's something to eat. It would be rude to not order enough food. So if you're short, you're going to be sorry. Playing enough for me and the bros and all the flamingos, because everyone knows flamingos like to party. Oh, man, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I thought there was a short joke in there, and I took offense to it. But uh, <laughs> aside from that, <laughs> no, that's I, I would love it, man. I would absolutely love it. Uh, we uh, when Katrin and um, Annie wrote their children's book uh, a year and a half ago, we, we got a copy of that and read it to our kids all the time and they love it. And uh i would love it to add it to our nightly routine so um Definitely you know will. what i'm gonna go out and do is throw out the invite to you to come to power monkey camp and we'd love to invite you back out to camp not so much as someone helping out with the kids but come out and hang out with some adults and uh do king kong in front of us and uh oh, yeah, give it a try yeah. michael do it michael do it. actually mike you can definitely do that workout now yeah, it, the embarrassing thing would be the part I would least want to do right now would be the cleans. Rightfully <laughs> <laughs> so, dude. That's heavy. Yeah, the, the, um, I remember when I when I was yeah when I was willing to want to do it. I think I couldn't do a ring muscle up like right, right when I got introduced to CrossFit. I was like, oh man, that'd be so cool. But Grant, the thing about if you come to camp, that will be fun to see you do that. But you could read your, uh, you could read, we have campfire stories and that would be really, really cool uh, to, to read your book. Cause I think all the adults, of course, you already know that, but they would love it. And then uh, yeah. these, these can be some pretty deep, uh, occasionally emotional moments. So I think that would uh, fit in really, really well with uh, Chad actually runs that for us. Yeah, I think that it's great. I was at dinner last night with a friend and I was telling some stories about the harder things and moments in life. And I ended up starting to cry and I was like, and they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to cry, but like, I'm cool with it. I don't feel weird about it. But like, I, sometimes I cry. Like, this is just a little break in the you know, chain. I didn't plan for this, but it just dipped real fast. And, and it, it creates moments when we allow ourselves to be a vulnerable and we, we access deeper information about stuff we've been through or what we're still working through. And, for me, but also them when I was able to be vulnerable, they started to share. And so I'm never afraid to be open and honest. And if anything, those are the greatest moments. Those are the deep dives. That's when we go swim around in the deep end a little bit versus just standing up and being like, this pool's nice. So yeah, I'd be down. Anytime, man. This is our 10 year anniversary and uh, trying to get uh, Jesse out with us too. Maybe we can get you both out to, to camp in the fall with us. Yeah, we were just uh, we were just on set together like a week ago, and she's she's in the depths of it as well with Ninja. When is it camp is? Uh, our ten year anniversary is going to be September twenty fourth to September thirtieth. Twenty fourth to the thirtieth, and the fifteenth is Ultimate Hawaiian Trail. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, no. the weekend. Jordan, sixteenth. Sixteenth. Roger, because I think are, we're. Are, are you in? Now. Are you in Kauai? Is that where you live right now, or are you on another I'm island? I'm on Oahu. Oahu, okay. Yeah, but it sounds like uh, the homies want to get some stuff together with Ice Barrel wants to do some stuff, Sisu San wants to do some stuff, Eric Hinman, <laughs> where I originally met him was that, and and we're thinking about like getting a house out there ahead of time, and we've always been wanting to teach uh, ninja and obstacles and stuff to the kids out there. And we just never really lined it up. And, uh, and so I'm assuming I'll be out there and it could be one of those I'm out there and then come over maybe after. And uh, I'm assuming, I don't know if any of y'all are doing the ultimate Hawaiian trail line, but it, it could be a good connection of weeks. Oh, we, we definitely got to give a shout out to, to Hafi and Sarah and everybody else who put on, 
uh, the Ultimate Hawaiian Trail Run. It's a phenomenal event. Uh, you know, we've been there with Power Monkey for a number of years. It's it's very close to Power Monkey Camp, so it makes it difficult for us to be able to go to Hawaii and then fly back. But Jordan's always there doing the uh, uh, part of the media team, and uh, we just we just love that whole crew and what they're doing out there. So, and I know that this is their ten year anniversary too this year. So uh, ours and theirs coincide as a ten year. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get some Power Monkeys out there and uh, hang out with you. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I, I, I'm just in the planning phase of things coming up right now. And there's some great stuff. Also, when is the game? When's the cross the games is before that, right? It's August or something. First, first uh, week of August. August. First, no, first week of August. I'm writing all this stuff down now. Obviously I'm planning right, <laughs> right now. <laughs> Welcome to my journal. Excellent. Excellent. Well, before we get you out of here, Grant, uh, you mind answering some quick ish questions? Oh yeah. I'm ready. Freaking quick draw. All right. First Ooh. one. What sport or discipline do you prefer, weightlifting or gymnastics? Weightlifting right now. Gosh, yeah. For now. <laughs> Thank you, Grant. Man, Thank I you. thought that was a shoe in coming to Power Monkey Care, coming to Flip Fest. No, apparently not. All right. Give that one to Mike. Um, <laughs> next one. Let's just move on. Whenever I don't get gymnastics, we move on quickly. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't stick around and dwell. <laughs> Number two, uh, any person you think would be great for us to interview? Somebody maybe you come across lately or someone that's kind of really uh, kind of stood out to you. That might, might be a good interview. There's some really good answers to this. And I, answers to this and I, I gotta think, okay. man, there's some great people. Um, There's always you know, a tough one. Pull someone out right off the well, top of your head. I mean, Bickle, I don't know if y'all know Bickle, but he's a great, yep. uh, a great story mm -hmm. of, of just applying himself and, fitness but also just a great attitude uh about life um and i i definitely think that he's someone that's fun to listen to uh as he tells stories too i think that's a part of you you can be someone who has a great story and then you can be a person that that tells a good story if you know what i'm saying and, and i think he can do both sure. yeah we haven't had back on before and uh mm -hmm. you know we've we Definitely cross paths quite a bit over the year. So uh yeah, I could probably give you a couple more answers to yeah. that too. No, that's a great one. That's a great one. Jordan, keep keep on him. Shout out All right. Let last one. Last one. Are you more of a uh TV show watcher or a book reader? I want to I want this to be a book reader. I want to be a book <laughs> reader. I like I said, I I am not a good reader. Uh, and that's where the ADHD really doesn't serve me well. I'll read a page eight times and not understand it. Um, but I also don't watch a ton of TV. It kind of, it doesn't serve me well. Cause I like, I'll be like, Oh, I just want to do something mindless. And it does. I don't, I feel like weird after, and I'm not, I don't know watching the stuff you watch. And so what I end up doing is I watch how to's on YouTube and spiral. I spiral and I learn, <laughs> you know, whether it's how to hang my drywall better or faster or techniques and tools and woodworking. And, and I will tweak on watching that stuff forever. YouTube, that's, it's a death spiral. Every time you go on there, it's never ending. YouTube never University, ending. baby. I think I actually, <laughs> you know, I just think about this day. I called a guy. I think my next thing I want to do is I want to build, I'm going to build a house from the ground up smaller not too crazy also have done handyman work uh, for just off time the last like 15 years so it's not like i don't know what i'm doing but i think i'm gonna build a house and i probably film it and say hey if you ever thought about building a house this is what it actually is like <laughs> so you want to you want to fix a roof you want to put that on youtube and come out to portland oregon and fix someone's roof i know somebody that needs a new roof <laughs> yeah and, you know i could but i've also learned there's certain jobs <laughs> You are better off paying, so, especially here in Texas, man. Like, <laughs> my buddies just did their roof. It was like the whole roof, four grand. I was like, yeah, oh dude, my. take my wow. four grand. <laughs> wow. Texas. I will fly grand. them to Oregon. I will fly yeah. them to Oregon and feed them if they want to do that. But uh, amazing, man. You are a man of many talents. Uh, unbelievable. I think we just kind of scratched the surface on all the things you got going on. And uh Excited to see how this last year of Ninja Warrior turns out for you. We're all pulling for you and be cheering for you along the way. Uh, before we get you out of here, where can people find you? And what do you got going on that you that you can let people know about? Yeah, I will say, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of not to say whatever. Uh, you can obviously follow anything I'm doing 
up to date most on my Instagram at Island Ninja. All social handles are the same though, Island Ninja on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook. I have a fan page there. I have a TikTok. Um, and I'm always update, updating videos and stuff there. But Instagram, you can see like where I'm at, where I'm going next. And I try to keep everyone in the mix. And people have been sending me internet challenges from all over. And now I'm putting them back out for people to try as well. So you guys can try some of these and do them with me. DM me, which, you, you know, whatever it is. And all the products now that I've been a part of, these companies I really care about. So if you got questions about them, ask me. What clothing do I wear with 10,000? Do I really like Cold Plunge and Sisu Sign? Do I like using... Reeboks and Nanos and is there better stuff? Like I'll be straight up with you. So I think there's a good way to connect with people there. And um, with what's going to come out for Ninja, I will say it's going to be very entertaining. Uh, wow, I really have to dance here. So I would say when my first run, assuming that there, that, that there, it could just be one run, but it could be more than one run. But if they happen to be, Either way, whatever comes out first is going to be, uh, it's just pay attention to after the balance <laughs> obstacle. Assuming I made, I can't say this. Oh my gosh. The first run is, is <laughs> really fun. And I hope it's funny. So, because I get what we're doing on the show. We're trying to, you know, stir it up and have a good time. And, and I had this one thing that I do and it gets everyone and i was like yeah i've been wanting to do this for over a year and i told my buddy i was going to do it and we did it and it worked so well all right man i can't wait i can't wait to watch it uh we'll keep an eye out for you man we appreciate it we really do hope to see you out in person at camp uh in the fall if you can make it i'm sure we'll run into each other before then uh but thank you again for the time really appreciate it and uh good luck with everything coming up and for all the listeners out there please be sure to head over to powermonkeyfitness.com for services and upcoming events. You can check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, at Dave Durante, and at Mike Service. And on behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your hosts. I'm Dave Durante with my co-host, Mike Service. And until next time, thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm.